All right. I get another try at this. So this is actually a talk written by Paul Grams and others at USGS uh, Grand Canyon Monitoring and Research Center. Uh, they are sequestered, and so I am here to give the talk. And this is about linking morphodynamic response with sediment ba mass balance on the Colorado River, focusing here on Marble Canyon. Now, perhaps I should have mentioned this at the beginning of my talk, but um, you can think of the effect of dams really simply on channel morphology in terms of inputs minus outputs equals change in storage. So if we're thinking about the sediment, right, if we have more coming in than is going out, we'll get an increase in storage and say deposition of sediment. So directly downstream of a dam, the input is zero, right? And so typically what happens is bed degradation because we still have some outputs, negative sediment mass balance, and the bed degrades, right? Now in debris fan dominated canyons, the bed itself is sort of locked in place by these very large boulders where debris fans enter the system. So you don't really see widespread bed degradation, but rather degradation of the fine sediment deposits that are deposited in pools and eddy bars. And so, for example, in along the Green River, which I was just talking about, um, we have potential inputs from this sand bedded reach um, just upstream of Lador Canyon, which could be helping us to not go into a sediment deficit type of situation, right? Now in the Colorado River, on the other hand, Glen Canyon Dam is located just upstream of Marble Canyon, which is itself a debris fan dominated canyon. So there are no um, sediment inputs per se until you get to the Perea River further downstream. And so what's been observed in Grand Canyon over time is erosion of fine sediment from eddy bars and the channel bed. So that's a little bit what I was getting at toward the end of my last talk. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in trying to maintain these eddy sandbars. They're important. Um, recreational sites is the most obvious. Um, the only place to camp in Marble and Grand Canyons is largely on these sandbars. And so if they just slowly erode over time, um, there'll be nowhere left to camp. They're also important for habitat, um, riparian vegetation, um, cultural um, resources as well. And so the big problem in Grand Canyon is thus trying to maintain these sandbars without driving the system into further sediment deficit. Okay, and so there's been a lot of research going in to try to monitor this balance, um, both the left-hand side of the equation, which you can think of as the flux side of the equation. So can we monitor everywhere sediments coming in and going out of the system? That will give us one way to assess whether or not our river is in sediment deficit or sediment surplus. The other thing we can do, which is all we have in the Green River, is monitor changes in storage in the river itself, right? So I can go out and resurvey the topography and bathymetry, and if there's less sediment in a reach now than there was before, then presumably our balance is negative, okay? So in Grand Canyon, both of these things are being monitored, both the flux side of the equation and the change in storage side of the equation. Right? The, the data I showed from the Green River, which is sort of a complementary system, right now we just have this delta S component and we're implementing the input minus output component with real-time sediment flux monitoring and hope, hope to link those together over time. And I'll show you here some results that show some of the promises and difficulties in doing that. And so, again, the flux side of the equation requires monitoring of actual sediment loads in the river, in this case, fine sediment loads, which almost uniformly move as suspended sediment in the flow in the Colorado River. And then on the other side of the equation, um, measuring reach scale changes in topography. And so this brings up other questions of monitoring, which we've, we've talked about already today. What to measure? How do we extrapolate? are we measuring the right spots? And so what this talk is gonna look at is 
how well do our measurements of inputs minus outputs match our corollary measurements of changes in storage. And here's just a note, changes in storage can be highly localized, kind of a um, preview of the con conclusions. Changes in storage can be highly localized caused by interactions between local channel geometry and discharge. So local channel hydraulics can have a big effect on changes in storage, which gets back to what do I monitor? And of course, part of the problem with the flux side is you can't monitor the flux at every single location in a river system. You're going to get some endpoints that bound different reaches. So here just to highlight um, the monitoring system in the Colorado River, and here's just an example of an eddy pool. Um, what we know is that since dam uh, creation, since the Glen Canyon Dam was um, inserted, there's been a net sediment deficit in the system. So sandbars have gotten progressively smaller. The channel bed is coated in a lot less sand as it's continuously being flushed out of the system just by normal operational flows. And so all of the flow is controlled in the system and there's no floods. But the flow is typically higher, right? Base flows have been increased while peak flows have been decreased. And so you end up with a system that's sort of always in the range where it can continually um, transport fine sediment. Before the dam, you'd have these big floods and then nine months of the year where sediment just accumulated on the bed to supply the next floods. And so the question is, how can we build sandbars without driving the system further into sediment deficit? Because once it's in Lake Mead, it's not coming back without a lot of money, right? And so the only sand source in Grand Canyon and Marble Canyon are tributaries. And again, that's sort of contrast to the Green River where we have this big sand bedded reach. In fact, Glen Canyon itself, which is now underwater, was more like that and perhaps could have provided a lot of sediment. And so all of the sediment is stored in eddies and pools. Rapids, right, don't really store any sediment. So what we can see in this plot is here's um, Lake Powell, Glen Canyon Dam, and essentially the sediment flux is zero until you get to the Perea River, which is the major contributor of sediment to Marble Canyon. So there's sediment monitoring stations everywhere you see a red dot delineating different reaches of the Colorado River system. And so, for example, we monitor inputs from the Perea River and we monitor um, the flux past uh, a gauge at 30 miles downstream from there, uh, 61 mile. The Little Colorado comes in, provides a lot of sediment as well, and then again, periodic sediment gauges in between. And so that's giving us the input minus output side of the equation. Let's see, I have some cheat sheet here as well. Um, and so again, an important point to note here is that if we just start putting floods through the system to try to rebuild eddy sandbars by entraining sediment from the bed and putting it uh, up at higher elevations, if there hasn't been enough sediment input from tributaries, you're simply going to slowly drive the system further and further and further into sediment deficit. So part of this real-time monitoring also is what triggers um, experimental high flows or controlled floods to try to build these sandbars. So we essentially monitor um, sediment inputs from the Perea until they're sufficient such that high flow experiment can go through, rebuild the sandbars, but end it soon enough that you don't continuously flush more sediment out. And so I'm going to focus here on Marble Canyon, which is from 0 to 61 miles, so Lee's Ferry to the confluence of the Little Colorado River. And you can see there's flow and acoustic sediment gauge data here at this example at 30 mile and at 61 mile. And the idea was, okay, we'll, we'll continuously monitor the inputs minus outputs, and then we'll take some representative reaches, and they're a little bit hard to see, but they're in yellow here, and really get super detailed surveys of some of these sub-reaches 
about 20% of the reach. And see how does our change in storage data compare to our input minus output flux data. Just to give you an example of some of the sediment flux monitoring uh, that occurs, um, using an acoustic Doppler system and backscatter and attenuation properties, you can actually get really good real-time monitoring data of suspended sediment concentrations. Um, using different frequencies, you can get the silt and clay concentration, which we're generally less interested in because it mostly just blasts through the system. Um, you can also get sand concentrations um, continuously, but you can also even get the grain size of the sand. So this is an example showing changes in the grain size of the sand with water discharge. Here showing the hydrograph as well. And it's been shown that the grain size of the sand is also very important to the properties of bar building and the entrainment potential of the sediment as well. So again, these are the types of systems that we're going to have five set up surrounding Dinosaur National Monument on the Green and Yampa Rivers as well. And Dave Topping is really the, the head honcho of this operation. I just wanted to show that. Uh, you got this video ready to play. So this, I got a little video here. We've got discharge on the log scale and suspended sediment concentration on a log scale here. And this is just a cloud of data from 18 months. And the red show one day of data. So you can go ahead and click that. So just to give you an idea of the variability in sediment flux in this system, even for a given discharge, we can see ranging over, you know, at least an order of magnitude, the two orders of magnitude for a given discharge, contingent on inputs from tributaries. And so the sediment concentration discharge rating curve is very unstable, thus again requiring this real-time monitoring to ensure that when floods are moved down the system that there's sufficient sediment available. So what you can do with that sediment monitoring data then is for each one of these subreaches, 0 to 30 mile, 30 to 61 mile, is compute the inputs minus outputs and then come up with a theoretical change in storage. So this is just showing some different monitoring periods here from 2002 to 2004 in Upper Marble Canyon. Um, it looked to be that 330,000 megagrams of sediment had accumulated in that intervening reach due to tributary inputs from the Perea. But there's a lot of uncertainty in that data, right? Plus or minus 200,000. And as you go to longer and longer time periods, that uncer uncertainty accumulates, simply additive, right? So by the time you start trying to work out an input minus output sediment budget over the scale of, say, 12 years, or it looks like 10 years, your uncertainty is about five times greater than the actual budget you calculate. So basically, it's indeterminate and you don't know, right? But we still need to collect this data because it's fundamental to triggering the high flow releases so that we can know how much sediment is on the bed? Is there enough um, sand accumulation from tributary inputs that putting down a controlled flood won't just sweep everything out of the system? Okay, so I think that's all I want to say there. But again, the uncertainty starts to be a, a big problem. Now, on the other hand, we can map the storage change directly. So this is the delta S component of the problem. This is just showing a multi-beam bathymetry image. Um, and you can even see sand bed forms very clearly on the bed of the Colorado River and deep pools. This is actually looking upstream. So if you think about mapping the storage change directly, well, one pro is that the uncertainty doesn't accumulate over time. You have some measurement uncertainty, but right, I can compare a 2012 to a 2000 surface, and the only uncertainty is whatever measurement uncertainty. It's not accumulating over time. You're also directly measuring the resource of interest, in this case, sandbars. But of course, it's very labor intensive. How do you sample? How do you extrapolate? And so really the idea is, you know, we need this sediment flux monitoring in order to really um, 
time these high flow experiments, but we need to measure what's happening into the channel so we know that it's working and try to refine these methods over time to track these changes. And so if you look at the comparison between the morphologic and sediment budget, um, right, if you go back to this equation, those instruments monitoring sediment flux are giving us one number, and we can go and measure these long reaches and subtract the surfaces, a DEM of difference, which we heard about earlier, right, and we can get a number for the change in storage during that time, same time period, and presumably they should be equal if we're doing a good job. And what you can see here on this plot, um, since I'm down to five minutes, We'll focus on this middle panel here, which is Upper Marble Canyon. Here's Lower Marble Canyon. And what we're showing is the sand mass balance on the y-axis. And what these two gray lines show are the upper and lower uncertainty bounds on that sediment mass balance. Now, what Paul has done here is every time where there's a dotted line is a time when a full bathymetric survey was done, and he's reset the sand balance to zero at that point. Okay, so you can see in between surveys, when there's a long period of time in between surveys, you start to accumulate a lot and a lot and a lot of uncertainty in your sediment flux mass balance. The little black dots show the delta S measurement from repeat mapping of these reaches. And so, for example, you know, here in about 2004, did a pretty good job, was about zero, spiked up a little bit, positive, generally got the sign right, but showed too much deposition relative to what the sediment flux measurements are showing. Later on, a couple months later, showed erosion, but too much relative to what the sediment flux measurements are showing. And I should mention that, you know, the sand is some very high dollar sand in the Grand Canyon. And so this, it's really important to try to nail down these numbers because every time you do one of these high flow releases, you're losing um, power generation revenue. That's part of the reason why there's so much effort going into this. Here showing in Lower Marble Canyon a somewhat similar trend. And so what it turns out to be is that Sites of erosion and deposition are highly localized. And so this is a plot showing um, depth of the channel going downstream from 42 to 46 mile. Um, in blue is showing the bed elevation change during some survey period. And so what you can see is that there's lots of areas of the channel where not much is happening, like riffles. And there's other areas of the channel, like pools, where you're seeing a lot of change. And in fact, if you look at the volume of sediment, even in just one of these pools, relative to what the mass balance for the entire 30 kilometer or mile long reach says, um, that sediment mass balance from that whole reach, from the inputs minus outputs, is roughly equivalent to what you might be storing in a single pool or eddy complex. And so it really gets back to this sampling problem where if we miss some areas of really high or low sediment deposition or erosion, we could be missing the whole sediment budget. Um, let's see if I have any notes here. So I guess one of the take home points in that in that slide is that a small net change in storage can be the result of summing up a lot of large changes in storage. So every one of these pools might be a big number. When we add them all up, we might get a relatively small number, right? Such that, again, if we miss one of these, we could be missing our sediment mass balance and we could be eroding sandbars out of the Grand Canyon without knowing it. Now Paul threw in a couple slides here just to show that this isn't a problem unique to fan eddy systems in in the Colorado Plateau region. This is an example from a braided river. Whoa, there we go. Um, 
showing in red the change in volume based on uh, full three-dimensional DEM surfaces, which show a lot of degradation, versus cross-sectional measurements, which show relatively less. So again, you get a different answer whether or not you just survey individual cross-sections or you do full bathymetric mapping. And here's just another example from braided reach of some of Joe Wheaton's work showing highly localized sediment erosion and deposition. Um, and so what you can see is individual eddies as well respond diff differently even given the same boundary conditions. So during a period where there was a positive sediment budget, this sandbar tended to erode while this one tended to build. Alternatively, during a period with a negative budget, this sandbar actually built while this sandbar further downstream eroded. And so you get this really localized response of individual eddies. So what these plots are showing is as discharge increases, the volume of sand in this part increases. As discharge increases at this site, sandbar volume decreases, right? And we don't know why that is yet. And so that's further research, right? To try to understand those hydraulics. And those types of reaches or, or individual eddy responses can be found in relatively short reaches. And so basically the take home point here is that simply monitoring these three individual segments of channel wasn't sufficient to properly um, come up with a sediment budget based on these changes in storage. So what's happening now is we're actually monitoring, we're going to go and measure this entire reach except for the rapids. So we'll be getting 84% of the reach in terms of that delta S part of the equation. And we're hopeful that if we map it all, our I minus O will equal our delta S, if you will. And so, again, really highlights this important problem of trying to monitor the right reaches without monitoring at all. So at this time in the Grand Canyon, we're going to monitor it all, and hopefully we'll come up with some better way to stratify the monitoring so it can be applied elsewhere in a little bit more limited sense. All right, thanks. We probably have time for one question. Oh, sorry, we'll bring you the mic right there on the left front. Hi, right. that was a, it's a really uh, fascinating study, and uh, I imagine it a lot of hours and, and money. So, one question uh, about maybe the differences in in doing the geomorphic changes, and then you're monitoring the suspended sediment. Mm -hmm. How are you accounting for uh, the bed load material? So, albeit it's a small fraction, could that um, fraction make up the difference that you're seeing? That's a good question. And in Lodore Canyon, that's something we're definitely grappling with because you know, we can actively watch bed load migrating into the system from upstream. Now, in the Grand Canyon, there's been a variety of studies to show that basically any flow above about 9,000 CFS is sufficient that you, you're always in suspended mode, more or less. And any fine sediment won't accumulate for more than a few months before it's simply flushed out. So that goes back again to the, the flow regulation component where we've ramped up the base flows so much that bed load is actually, bed load transport of the fine fraction isn't actually that common. And so is generally just ignored here. But pre-dam, nine months of the year, you know, we would have been below 9,000 accumulating sand on the bed. That load migration would have been important. But the general consensus is here that the flows are always high enough and energetic enough that essentially everything is moving in suspended load. Okay, thank you very much.